Well, here we are, second day of our discussion of the mass-mediated communication. We're moving along looking at various theories. There's a kind of evolution to our various theories, and if we can get our first PowerPoint slide up, we will see that one of the groups of theories that we're going to talk about today are referred to as stalagmite theories. Now, I have to ask you to recall your study of caves. Uh, stalagmites occur as water drips down from the top of the cave and builds up slowly a drop at a time. You may remember that we began the chapter in our discussion of mass-mediated communication asking ourselves whether media have dominant effects, moderate effects, or limited effects upon individuals. The original concern coming out of a propaganda model was that the media would have a dominant effect. And then we know, for instance, that our old friend Clapper, writing in 1960, argued that the media may really have a fairly minimal or a moderate effect upon us because we tend to be selective in what we look at and what we listen to, how we look at it and listen to it, what we remember, what we recall. And so we don't just approach the media with some kind of unthoughtful, unthinking, unfiltered, unformed set of opinions. So certain people began to have to work within those guidelines, those boundaries, those, if you want to use the word, parameters. One of those was a fellow by the name of George Gerbner, who was one of the true superstars in media research in the United States, taught at the University of Pennsylvania, the Annenberg East, as we refer to it, for a very, very long time. He did research, which eventually came to be called cultivation theory. I've mentioned that or featured that as one of the stalagmite theories cultivation theory, and the premise that is central to understanding that theory is that repeated exposure to similar content either creates or reinforces attitudes. Now, what in the world does that mean? Gerbner's argument is that our exposure to the media, particularly television, and keep in mind that over and over and over again, since the 1950s, media studies have largely focused on television because television may be a very unique phenomenon, only as we will see in chapter 10 to be replaced by new communication technologies which may take television to an even higher level of understanding or higher role within our society. Or maybe some people will argue to a lower role, I don't know. Repeated exposure to similar content creates or reinforces certain attitudes. The argument is that television programming has certain themes that are repeated day after day after day after day after day. And I try in that kind of statement to capture the sense of the drip, 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 drip of the water from the top of the cave creating a stalagmite. The argument is that no single day does media affect us dramatically unless something truly dramatic occurs. That rather what happens is that the effect that media have on us can be accumulative. One small particle of calcium at a time added to a pile of calcium sooner or later becomes a column in a cave. Well, let's take a look at some of the more specific lines of analysis that Gerbner and others have used to explore cultivation theory. His line particularly is focused upon news and other kind of content, programming, even including a bit of attention to movies, and he argues that repeated messages such as the news focus on violence. Is it fair to say that the news focuses on violence? My wife and I years ago in Albuquerque were absolutely amazed at what they would show us. The body was found in the kitchen and then the television camera would go along 
where the body had been shot perhaps and there was a trail of blood from and we're saying we don't want to watch this this is not necessarily newsworthy but night after night after night attention given to the violent side of our life murder mayhem automobile accidents explosions can cultivate and I use that word as Gerbner would cultivate it cultivate a frame we're going to talk more about framing theory in a little bit or view of reality Want to use the word terministic screen in that regard? That these terministic screens get established one little drip of water at a time. That may actually not be true, but are perceived to be a true sense of reality. Now what do you mean by that, you might ask? What do you mean doesn't actually represent reality, but seems to be true? Well, let's imagine that we ask individuals that watch a lot of television. That's what Gerbner did. He talked about high viewers, a lot of hours of televiewing, particularly televiewing of news, moderate televiewing, and minimal televiewing. Higher use of television led to people reporting that there was greater amount of violence in society. A greater amount of violence than would be reported by the moderate or the minimal level viewer. So you've got people segregated into three categories. A lot of televiewing, moderate amount of televiewing, minimal amount of televiewing. People that watch more television believe there's more violence. Is it because then all of the violence that's on television convinces them, creates the frame that a lot of violence occurs? Or do people that worry more about violence watch more television? And that's often been the case. Uh, I mean, uh, the basis of the argument there. Yeah. What about, um, you know, a lot is focused on whether violence on TV, like in television programming, if that promotes violence in society, do you think that the emphasis on violence in news, does that glamorize violence? Does that contribute? It might, although many of the people who have this mean world syndrome don't necessarily see that violence is glamorous, but they see that violence is out there and very threatening to them, and these are often people that then feel somehow constrained to stay within their house. Older people may feel this kind of way. The world is a very scary place, so I shouldn't go out. And then the argument is the more you don't go out, the more television you watch, the more television you watch, the more you see violence, and it becomes a reinforcing uh, a fact, uh, or factor on your sense of the world around you. And in a sense, you sort of train yourself through the use of television and your own perception of the world to move to a greater concern or awareness that violence exists. Now, the notion of violence being glamorized becomes a little bit more problematic because that can be the case. We saw a little bit of that with the notion of social learning theory, Bandura's study of Bobo the doll, where the children saw violence, they went back and punched the doll. The bigger question there, and we'll deal with this also later today when we look at Van Evera's model on page 9, I mean on page uh, 358, uh, figure 9.3, her argument is that some of the effect of television deals with the amount of televiewing that we gain, our perception of reality, and also the perception of whether the entertainment or news is real or dramatic. Real or dramatic. The more we believe it is real, it's going to have different effects on us than if it is dramatic. We also know through interviews that people that are interested in engaging in criminal behavior may use news and crime shows as finishing school. Uh, they may study criminality by watching to see how other criminals get caught or don't get caught, what they do, and we have often what are called copycat crimes, uh, this sort of thing. You had a question a minute ago. Well, actually, two, a question and a statement. Um, on, the, on that study, is there any comparison towards actual violence and what people report as the amount of violence? Yes, within a community. What is the likelihood that a violent act will be 
committed. You can use that as baseline data and then you can ask yourself which of these three populations, heavy viewers, moderate viewers, or low viewers, come closer to the actual baseline prediction within a community. And what, what is the answer Typically, to the lower viewer comes in closer to what the baseline data actually are because the whole notion is that television news reports so much of violence that then people that watch a lot of it, whether they think there's a lot of violence and they tune in to see whether that's true or not, uh, that's one of the methodological problems that leads to this kind of debate. But the notion is that television can give us then a false sense of reality. I think that's the key theme. And the more television we watch, the more false our sense of reality could actually be. Does that make sense? Yeah. You had a comment or a question? Oh, uh, well, it's just um, it's in response to the answer, but I don't have a question anymore. Okay. Um, I think it's interesting to imagine when people try hard, and I think there are some really good and responsible news persons out there, they try hard to give us a sense of the world and the reality. The truth is that we always know if we see this in a sort of distanced way, that it is a sort of snapshot of a problem, and it may be a small percentage of the people that are involved in it. Last night, for instance, and I'm saying this on television, right? Last night doesn't mean anything. We had a storm in Houston, seven to nine inches of rain. We had 13 tornadoes turned uh, touched down. We had a lot of people whose lives were affected by this. We saw some of them dramatically presented on television. My guess is, and I say this in part because I heard some people from Kansas City talking about it this morning saying, my gosh, I wouldn't live in Houston because of all the storms they have. One little storm, and if you were born and raised in Houston, you say, this was not that bad of a storm. Millions of people got home last night quite safely. There were a lot of people that were not harmed. So you see, there is that reality out there as well. I think there were no fatalities last night. There were some pretty interesting news events that occurred. One guy was rescued from a car in the bayou or something like that. I didn't get the full story, but here was a fellow being lifted with one of these harnesses by a helicopter. We look upon that probably, if we've lived in Houston long enough, of in terms of the effectiveness of the emergency response people in the city of Houston. We're a good city. We are able to handle that. People from the outside that see that, people that were from the outside that saw Allison, they couldn't believe it. And I think that the people locally that have more of a sense of the reality as reality respond to that differently than the people do who only see a telemediated reality. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it's not nowadays. It's always been there. You can go back to the earliest uh, newspapers published in the United States. It, there's a little equation that you should learn if you're in journalism, and that is sensationalism sells copies. Copies sell advertising. Advertising keeps your job. It's the point I'm making. You bet. Yeah. I think we're getting, uh, I think there's a fundamental concept that it's not news unless it's bad news. You know, it's but always negative. That's what we've always news. talked about. Then we talk about sensational news. Used to be, I remember one time studying the Atlanta Constitution because I was interested in a, an, an event called the Cotton States Exposition. And a very famous person gave a speech there. It became very important in the history of of eventually what were what was the civil rights movement and so forth in the midst of that there was an axe murder and the Atlanta Constitution ran the account of this axe murder day after day after day after day after day and into the trial and nowadays we see an event occur and the trial will occur two years later well that didn't happen back in those days get people to trial as soon as possible etc etc and I forget whether the person was executed or whatever happened there, but, you know, an axe murder. Now, what is the likelihood of an axe murder occurring in Atlanta in those days? Compared to all the other things that happened, but on the front page, day after day, why? Because can you imagine the conversation? 
the axe murder, the max murder, we want to know about that. Look at the attention given to this guy Durst. It was bizarre, it was wacko, it was strange. He may very well have been guilty. But didn't we really focus a lot more on that than life really amounts to? How many times in the history of the world are we going to find one guy that does those things? What do we really learn? But a lot of news time and attention given to this, right? It's, you know, news as entertainment. News as entertainment, Which and we've carried that new. perhaps we're, way too far. We're more upfront about the fact that that's the reality now, but I mean, it's always been that way. It's always been that way. But on the coverage yesterday, the uh, all of the local channels, you know, had nonstop coverage from early in the afternoon, and they even preempted the national news right. on uh, uh, everything but ABC. ABC had Peter Jennings for like the first 15 minutes, and then preempted the last half of it. Given the fact that there were no fatalities, I mean, isn't that a little, you know, overkill? I think probably, given what we probably needed to know elsewhere in the world. And, and they all follow suit. Like if, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure the, you know, the different local channels felt like because the other channels were covering it this way, they had to preempt the news as well. Copycat you know? coverage has become a real big issue in the United States. And then if you saw CNN this morning, as I did, CNN is running exactly a very limited number, but the same images that you saw last night, that the network locals had gathered the stuff. I put it out there, CNN rummages through it and says, which are the most interesting churches that are now demolished? And the one picture of the tree laying across the big house, that's a pretty interesting story and so forth. How anomalous is it out of how many houses there are in Harris County? Well, I was curious that every single news network seemed to have a truck in front of the teeter-toddler daycare that had a tree fall to it. I'm just wondering, how do they all end up there at the same time? How in the world they can get through when the EMS and nobody else can get through, when Centerpoint can't get in there and get the electricity back on, but the news media can get their trucks in there. They must have little pontoons or something that they throw out and float those down the bayou and bring them out, amphibian or something like that. Well, anyway, repetition, this drip, 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 shapes conceptions of social reality. Now, there's a term called mainstreaming or homogenization of the perceptions that we have, meaning that if we're all exposed to the same information, entertainment, values, senses of reality, that slowly over time this can affect us. There is always the great concern that each generation is fundamentally corrupt in the mind of each preceding generation. And one of the arguments is television and television entertainment corrupts the morals of the young. Well, the irony of it is if you go back and ask people 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, are the young fundamentally corrupted? The answer is yes. So it's nothing new to think that. But if you're exposed to rock and roll over and over and over again, do you begin to think and react differently than did the people that were exposed to Frank Sinatra and Guy Lombardo? Now, some of these names you've never heard of. And if we get too close in time in popular music, you will use names that I've never heard of. Yeah. So is it almost correct to say No, I don't think that at all. I think that each generation worries that the next one will be worse than they are. And it's like, okay, let's use our generation, for example. We have, like, gang violence, all kinds of crazy stuff happening. We had juvenile delinquency when I was a boy. Right, I just don't see it getting worse. But the perceptions are that it is getting worse. One of the things I find interesting is if you go back to look at movies that were made in the 40s and the 50s, what is the likelihood that people there will be using language that grandmothers did not used to know or didn't use? And now on television, for instance, you can hear comedians using language that I thought was relegated for construction workers. And are we as a society better or worse? Well, you see what I'm getting at is that people look at that and say, all of that, I have a, uh, I know of a young woman who has a younger sister, they're about five years apart, and the older one said to the younger one, your generation is such a trashy mouth bunch, I don't even want to listen to you anymore. And I'm thinking, this is not even generation, this is within the same family and five years removed. Well, right, don't... 
start off with a Wally and Beaver kind of there generation. There you go. That's what was on right, years but ago. Nowadays Wally it's would like, not have said the same things that some people would right. on television today. And so in comparison, nowadays the TV is a lot worse. But what I'm saying is like nowadays no, 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 we already no, no. see... TV is not worse. Well, you're the you're, actions you're on using TV. the worse in terms of the medium rather than content. It's a question of what's shown. Right. I have seen Frank Sinatra on a lot, and I've never seen Frank Sinatra's midriff. Right, but, but what I'm saying is you because... You show me a, oh a female star today who doesn't have her midriff, and I don't know, did Cher create that? You know, I don't know. Yeah. Get any worse than that? If we already see midgets and people cussing on TV and violence on TV, it's not like they can. Don't show you any think worse every violence. generation thinks can it get any worse not than really. this? Oh no 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 whoa 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 manipulate we're, we're, manipulate manipulate is a very interesting word we talk about that you'll even hear me talk about that on Thursday where I talk about things like an hegemony where the elite create an ideology a point of view that they are trying to impose and get us to buy into but manipulate that assumes that we're a very passive people. I don't think that we're a very passive people. I think that we make all kinds of judgments. I think we use all kinds of filters to decide what we want. And this whole notion that the media can manipulate us is a dominant effects model and there's not a lot of evidence that proves that that works. A good example of this. Well, actually, now people are stealing all of that, so nobody's selling anything anymore. Brainwashing. There's a nice word for us, isn't it? As though people, see, he's worried that the next generation couldn't be more corrupt than his generation, and you're talking about brainwashing and all of this. Yes. I think the statistic on the amount that people listen to the lyrics is only like 3 to 5 percent. So and, and in my case, I can't understand the lyrics, so you know, there I'm left out. Oh, no, 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 whoa, boy, are we going along the way now? We're getting into dominant media effects that we're a bunch of mindless bozos, except for you, and, and everybody else out there is just going along with all of this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the truth is that evidence does not show that. Even on the part of children, children resist a lot of things that they are exposed to. We resist an enormous amount of stuff. I do not buy every product that I see advertised. There are products out there advertised for women that I have no real incentive. There are products advertised out there, used to be for ad older adults that I had no interest in, and now I'm beginning to be interested in some of those. So you see, what we use, we're going to talk about uses and gratifications if we get that far, and we've got to get that far. The argument is that we use the media as sovereign viewers to entertain us, to inform us, to help us to get clearer attitudes and so forth, rather than the dominant effects. We are manipulated because we're a bunch of unthinking bozos. I would argue to say that the media has never portrayed life as it really is. Just That's as fine. In the 50s, it wasn't as wholesome, and now it's not as I corrupt. don't know. You see, was that the case? Were we a less wholesome society, or did we report differently on people? I think we often today say, look at what Kennedy did in the White House with Monica. That was not the first president. I mean, Clinton. That was not the, well, I could have said Clinton, Kennedy, didn't I? I might have even said FDR, might I have? Did Eisenhower have a young woman that was his aide-de-camp hanging around with him and so forth? This is not new to Bill Clinton. Now, maybe what Bill did was different and more newsworthy in certain respects. What was interesting is that when the stuff came out on Bill Clinton, Larry Flint gave $200,000 to an intern that would, turn, that would turn rat on somebody else, and I think that five senior members of the Republican House or Senate said, I'm out of office because I know that I'm going to be fingered here. I mean, a lot of stuff may go on, but what do we report on? There was a time, for instance, when we didn't report on Certain things about FDR, reporting styles, framing. We're going to talk about that today. Yes, Is that we're getting so excited here. That we're more conservative now that we can. I don't more? know. What do you think? 
I don't know. Maybe more. We're not as conservative on certain issues, but we're still not where Europe is. You're talking to us about Europe. Your advertising over there shows body parts that we keep discreetly covered over here. Now, are you a are you a wilder society than we are? Ah, oh, that's not the question that I asked. Are you a wilder society? I wouldn't ask the same question if this were the Netherlands, because we know what goes on in Amsterdam. Yes. Uh, supposedly, the uh, the television media in Europe is more open in terms of sexuality, but I hear the the uh, amount of violence on television is in America is far higher than anywhere else in the world. Well, we are often characterized, this even gets into the, the attributions of the President of the United States, we're a cowboy society. There were people that knew us, you don't know the show Bonanza, but it was very, very popular. It was about a ranching family and they were shoot them out every week on television. We had gun smoke for years. We exported all of that kind of fair to the rest of the world, and the world thought of the United States as a place where people spend half their time shooting with six guns. And then in the state of Texas, we put into place a concealed handgun law and then found that we couldn't carry them anywhere, but, you know, that wasn't it. Okay, mean world syndrome. If we watch enough of this, we become homogenized in our opinions. There is a mean world syndrome. A lot of violence occurs because I see a lot of violence on television. Drinking is fun and without consequences. How do I learn that? By watching beer ads. Everybody in beer ads has a great time. They drink beer and nobody ever gets drunk, runs into anybody in an automobile, or has a bad liver. Inferior knowledge of nutrition and attitudes toward eating. Each time I tune into television, look at all the wonderful food I see there. Unfortunately, it's loaded with fat, salt, and sugar. See what I'm getting at is that the world may give us a false impression of what's going on. Incorrect, and incorrect or inappropriate body shape type models. There is a very strong feminist line of analysis that young women are likely to suffer eating disorders because they see very, very thin models and they then worry that they are not thin enough and they then engage in behavior which can be very, very harmful to them. Sex without consequence, isn't this the soap opera? Doctors are kind, caring, and expert. Most of you are not old enough to remember Marcus Welby. He was a physician that actually made house calls. He talked to people. We now think that a physician is somebody that is a little scientific machine. Businessmen are crooks, con men, and clowns. J.R. Ewing. It was actually a study of content on television a number of years ago, and anyone who was a prominent, successful businessman is a crook or a con man, and in one, exam in one instance, that person was a clown, and even in that regard, the buffoon businessman is a recurring metaphor in literature and television, isn't it? But the one that was most particularly was the guy whose mother had given him a television station, and so he ran it and he didn't know anything about television stations. Reckless driving without consequences. None of you have ever heard of the Dukes of Hazard. But even then, isn't it true that car ads give you this notion that you can go very, very fast and none of those car ads ever have any problem? And one of the reasons is that nobody else is around. Have you ever noticed that? These car ads are zooming along 3,000 miles an hour in a very expensive automobile on a road where nobody else is out there. The Dukes of Hazard had all of these high-powered performance, as I recall it, Chrysler Corporation cars, probably Dodges. A young man nodding his head, you've watched Dukes of Hazard, And they leap. The Admiral somebody was one of these, but they also had the quintessential buffoon boss hog or something like that. It was the local rich guy, and they could always figure out how to steal money from him. He was the clown. You see how these metaphors are out there? Obesity is safe. I call this the John Candy syndrome. Uh, we often look at people like John Candy, who was very much overweight, and Overweight people on television are often presented as happy people. 
And we may know that that may not be the case, but we like this metaphor. They're happy people, and then they die uh, much earlier because weight is one of the contributing factors to uh, increased uh, early death. Well, in all of this, if you ask people whether these are true or false because of the media viewing, high viewers tend to believe these hypotheses that we can offer out there. Now, these are somewhat dated. I don't know what is current in your uh, life today. Maybe CSI is convincing people that every crime gets solved. My guess is that the statistics of unsolved crimes hasn't changed much over the last number of years. Da 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 da. But we have this notion that because CSI always solves the crimes, that crime labs are perfect. We know in the city of Houston that crime labs may be relatively imperfect, et cetera, et cetera. So, what is reality versus telereality? And we often use that word telereality. But the theme is that the amount of viewing and the kind of content viewed leads to the formation of messages. Some would argue that this actually can be better explained by reinforcement theory, meaning that we tune in to see the suspicions that we have about the world reinforced. Selective exposure, selective whatever it might be. Socialization theory. Socialization theory often looks at the effect of televiewing on children. People become socialized through media exposure. Several factors predict the nature and degree of socialization. This is sort of an extension of some of the work by Bandura, if you would. It also has to do with repeated exposure. Uh, having two wonderfully fine little grandchildren, we watch a certain amount of videos. One of those is Dumbo. I hope all of you have seen Dumbo. Dumbo was about a flying elephant. And he is at first ridiculed and his mother is put in solitary confinement and finally people find out how well Dumbo can fly. Dumbo does amazing things and he and mama become very very wealthy and successful at the end of the movie. His agent which is a mouse is very very rich and all of this kind of stuff sort of the American ideal. So I ask my grandchildren well what do you think about this and it's amazing how little attention they pay to some of the things that I might see as an adult. Well, by asking them may point to things that may influence how they remember. One of the themes that comes into socialization, for instance, is that children are socialized by television differently if they watch television in the presence of parents, older peers or older siblings who then make comments about the messages that are being communicated. Children are much more likely to believe that toys perform as they are presented if they watch them by themselves than if they watch them by older siblings. A, a younger child seeing something on television, Barbie is doing the most amazing things. Child says, I want Barbie, and the older sister or brother says, that's really dumb. Uh, it's never going to work that way. I know somebody that bought that toy and they just hated it. Well, did the television have a manipulative effect on somebody that didn't have very good buying behavior guidelines, a child, or did the intervention of interpersonal communication alter that sense of reality. These are the sorts of things that Van Evra uh, is looking at in her work. And what I think to be one of the really interesting models is presented to you on page 358, figure 9.3. She sort of breaks the world into, first of all, the use of the media, secondly, the perception of reality, the amount of viewing, and finally, information alternatives. If we look at the world as though it's informative as opposed to being diversion, it's likely that we may interpret the media differently. We mentioned a while ago there was a question that said, what happens if uh, people began, in a sense, to see or use the media to learn about crime? What's interesting is, do I see that informative, particularly if I'm a potential criminal, or do I see it purely as diversion? Last summer I saw the Italian job, and one of the things that I noted was how difficult it would be to be a criminal. I think it's really daunting to be able to do the sorts of things that they did, and I sort of resolved to the 
conclusion that it's probably easier to live a non-criminal life, plus you've got to worry about somebody shooting you in the middle of the winter out on a, you know, an open road and all of that kind of thing, and life is just way too messy, right? So I, do I see that informative? I'm going to learn how to pull big heists, or am I going to see that purely as diversion? Perceived reality, do I see this as real or unreal? Amount of viewing, heavy or light, heavy or light, heavy or light, you see how that runs across. And then finally, information alternatives. These information alternatives can be other individuals. The opinion leaders that we've talked about, opinion leaders can be older siblings, can be friends, can be parents, can be work associates. The argument is that the people with whom we communicate interpersonally can influence the impact that television has on us. So, you look through this model, it's very nicely laid out. Somebody that sees television as information, sees it as real, views heavy, has few alternative information sources, is going to experience maximum effect, she argues. Somebody that sees it as diversion, as unreal, as light viewing, has many alternatives, sees it as having the least effect. So the argument is then that the effect of television, as an example, but books would be the same sort of thing. Children have books read to them. Uh, but people that write books and people that publish books worry about the moral of the story. What do children likely learn? Do children learn to be kind and caring and giving? Do they have concern? Or at the end, do they come away believing that they should have prejudices and hatreds and uh, sort of mean and violent streaks through them. What, is, what are they learning? What are the lessons learned? What is the morale? Do the parents talk to them? Do the siblings around them talk to them? Do they talk among each uh, with one another? Well, we often do that in advertising. We sometimes watch ads because we've been talking about some product with our friends. We find somebody that has an allergy, and we say, oh, I saw a product on television, I don't know, but it looked to me like it was new, and you might want to look into it. Well, you see how the interpersonal interconnects with the part that is more just directly related to the media. All right, so we have use of media, information, perception of being real or unreal, amount of viewing, heavy or light, information alternatives. Based on these interactions... With these options, uh, we can predict that the media will have a kind of impact that range from dominant effects to least effects. So it suggests that that's a fairly complicated model. May also be influenced by viewing in the presence of someone who vets or interprets or criticizes or confirms messages such as an older sibling and a parent. So now we've covered a little bit, skimmed the surface anyway, of the stalagmite theory, two of them, cultivation and socialization theories, sort of introducing the question of just how much the effect of television might have on people and to what extent is that related to the amount of viewing uh, that we engage in. Agenda setting theory. Agenda setting theory developed in large part to try to explain the way in which political issues arise in society. Now, some of you know that yesterday Arnold Schwarzenegger was sworn in as the governor of the state of California. Those of you on tape, you'll have to go back and read about that in history books. Arnold Schwarzenegger got into politics in uh, the last number of years, but got very prominent, decided to run because Gray Davis was becoming increasingly unpopular. To what extent was Gray Davis unpopular because of issues raised by other politicians to what extent were the news media in the state of California reporting on the grievances and the problems of the Gray Davis administration? Well, it's an interesting kind of battle. Politicians like to believe that they raise issues and address them in campaigns, and journalists often like to believe that they raise issues which force politicians to address those issues. Now, we know that certain issues in certain communities are never addressed by anybody because it may not be popular within the editorial circumstances of that particular community. So a contest occurs between politicians and reporters. Even activists get involved at this at various times to set 
the political agenda, to put out ideas, issues, if you would, at a level of salience, meaning that they're more important to discuss, and secondly, framed in a particular way. Politicians create news which is reported. Reporters ask questions, thus an agenda emerges. In all of this, then, one of the things that we may be able to tell is what is on the mind of society by how people report the news in the media. There is a writer by the name of Nesbitt who a number of years ago talked about megatrends and what Nesbitt did was to monitor the proportion of reporting on various topics looking to see if in a time sequence the amount of reporting on certain topics would shift and change in such a way so that as topics get more attention they then become more important and we then have to pay more attention to them. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. The assumption being that there's something called a news hole. The news hole is a sort of conceptual dimension and that is that each day there is roughly the same amount of news reported and the proportion of time and space, print or electronic, that is given to any news story will at least suggest to people how important that story is in their mind and world at a given time. Yesterday in Houston, a lot of news hole attention given to the weather in Houston. Very little attention to other stories anywhere else around the world. We know that when 9-11 occurred, an enormous amount of news hole attention was focused on the collapse of the building, the heroism of people in and around the building, the personal suffering, a lot of attention then given to the perpetrators of this crime against citizens, residents, uh, visitors in the city of New York, as well as on airlines. So agenda setting theory seeks to understand the role of the media, candidates for political office, or other factors in generating media influence, at least to create a sense of what's important and what ought to be thought about. And what we find is that the original agenda setting theory argued that the reporters or the newspapers or the politicians could create opinions, tell us what to think, and then over time what we've discovered more likely occurs is they simply tell us what to think about. Our attentional space is very much like the attentional space of the reporting media, that we can only have certain things at the forefront of our mind at a given time, and that the media may, as well as politicians, raise or lower our interest in certain topics by the amount of time and the kind of coverage uh, that is devoted to those particular topics. So, essentially then, the agenda setting is the ability of mass media to structure audience cognitions. What are we thinking about? What are we thinking? How much do we think various topics are important? And they may even affect some change in our existing cognitions, but they may not. Agenda setting is the creation of public awareness and concern. It may have a lot to do with selective reporting. Uh, gatekeepers, uh, reporters as gatekeepers, uh, they're the ones that decide what gets in, what we're exposed to, what we get to see. The question is to what extent can the politicians influence that agenda and sometimes we know that the politicians uh, can indeed have a lot of influence in that regard because politicians want to talk about certain topics. They may want to talk about mass transit or they may want to talk about Medicare for the uh, aging. They may want to talk about uh, tax reductions or they may want to talk about uh, timbering policies or whatever it might be. Uh, so there's this kind of battle back and forth between the reporters, the editorialists, and politicians to define what is the political agenda at a given time. Relevant to this is the theory of framing. Framing simply argues that as people see the world, they see the world through terministic screens. We come back to that theme that I have talked about over and over and over again. Uh, 
I like the concept. I think it's very useful to us. Uh, the question is, to what extent do the words that we use to view reality give us an understanding of reality, almost a predictive or foregone conclusion as to what reality is, rather than do we see reality neutrally over and over again. Now, I think it's interesting. This ties in a little bit with agenda setting. It certainly is an example of framing. One of my journalism colleagues recently pointed out something. He and I and some other people are working on a book on terrorism. He pointed out something, and that is that in the last two or three weeks, and this is a lecture that's being given on the what, the 18th of November 2003. I say that for people that want to go back and sort of check this perhaps in the newspaper or on television, that the term used to refer to people that are having violent actions, making violent actions against American, Italian uh, military personnel in Iraq as well as the other people over there, such as the Red Cross and various kinds of international care organizations, the word is shifted from terrorist to insurgent. That's a different framing of those acts. Terrorism has all kinds of negative connotations that really bad people are trying to do something. Insurgent can sound very much like people fighting for freedom against an oppressive, dominant military force that is trying to impose a government on them that they do not want. Well, you see, when we go back to agenda setting, who gets to pick those terms? President Bush doesn't like to shift from terrorism to insurgent because it doesn't give him as much political rhetorical advantage. And so there's a debate as to how we should refer to individuals and the media are the gatekeepers. Well, therein lies this notion then of framing. How reporters frame news influences how audiences see that reality. How reporters frame the news influences how audiences see reality. Yesterday we had a big storm. How did the reporters frame the news? A lot of people being affected, a lot of tornadoes occurring, more cells of weather coming, uh, impending danger, pretty risky set of circumstances, and to some extent that's fairly true, isn't it? They even gave us some advice. If you can, stay where you are, don't venture out. If you do, don't do certain sorts of things, don't drive into deep water. Gave us prescriptions that many of us have learned over the years and some of us actually pay attention to, and some of us don't. A frame is the way, a terministic screen, that media reporters as gatekeepers use to, one, organize the news. What is news? Secondly, to present the news in events. Each way, then, is a frame. Are young people simply being rebellious, or are young people juvenile delinquents? Earlier we were talking about the kind of television fair back in the 50s when I was a youngster, and it was in my generation that the word juvenile delinquent was actually coined, and if you've ever heard West Side Story, they actually play on the notion uh, that they're now social misfits, and they see that in a very positive way. Back in the 60s, the students some members of the African-American community referred to police officers as pigs. The liberal media would have picked it up and referred to them as pigs. Well, one of the things that we often do in a situation like that is we reframe it and we take it on and we say, okay, I am a pig. And pigs are what I want to be. I am a pig. I'm a super pig. Right? We often co-opt a negative term and make it a positive term. Even racial slurs at various times can get picked up and turned around and made very positive. So you see the malleability. Uh, the same thing is true of feminism. There are times when people say, if I'm going to be referred as a, to as a bitch, I'm going to be a super bitch. So you turn around what is a negative and you make it a positive. Well, that's the, in a sense, if you would, the trickery, although it's not trickery, 
It's simply, in one sense, the way it works, but it is the selection of the people who are the gatekeepers of news to be able to interpret and to frame the news. Are people criminals if they attack the World Trade Center? Yes. Are they terrorists? Well, maybe. But you see, we would all agree that they are terrorists, I mean that they are criminals. Whether they're terrorists or not, they may or may not be. We may or may not have enough information to know that or not. One of the things, for instance, that happened in the 60s was that various cities in the United States burned, students created uh, activism movements, and some of this activism, some of this, quote, rioting was seen as mindless violence. And then careful study concluded that even in the middle of riots, people engage in extraordinarily selective behavior. Looting is just another form of shopping. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that looting is not criminal behavior. But it may well be that various people loot in various ways, whereas we often see people stealing televisions. Is it possible that some people are actually looting down at the local uh, grocery store? And it's a lot more interesting on television to see stealing televisions than it is stealing cans of corn. Both are looting, right? We also know that in some inner city businesses, records were kept, pawn shops and so forth, and the records were systematically destroyed. That's not mindless behavior. And I'm not excusing it. I'm simply saying that we often are given one impression, which may not be a true impression because of the nature of framing. Framing is a rhetorical act. Frames can be influenced by a political perspective. Is Rush Limbaugh likely to frame stories in the same way that more leftist or central reporters would frame the same sort of story? Some people might refer to women activists as doing something positive. And Rush, I've heard him say that these people are feminazis. Feminazis, in my mind, doesn't sound like at the outset, at least, to be a positive term. Now, they may turn it around and say, yes, I'm a feminazi, and I'm really a good feminazi. Frames also depend upon the information that is made available, such as war coverage. I grew up at a time as a child where I think we really liked the Second World War. We believed the Second World War was very good. And there's no doubt that the military news reporting was enormously propagandistic, featuring all of the good things that American GIs were doing, all of the victories, all of the celebrations. And it was a very substantial distortion. What happened in Vietnam several years later was we saw a very tedious war. We saw very little progress. And the way in which the reporters framed that war led people to not like that war. Now we have people in the military in Afghanistan. We've had them in Bosnia. Or we have them in Iraq. And how are we going to frame and interpret uh, those particular events? Are we an aggressor nation moving in to take the oil of Iraq so that we can drive around in big SUVs? Or are we really trying to bring freedom and liberty to people who obviously must be thirsting for it because we assume that they are. We maybe would think that we are, although I'm not entirely sure that we would be. Uh, so what happens? What is known to happen? How is this information interpreted because of the editorial frame of the reporter? Some of the things that had to happen during the civil rights movement is that people had to become convinced that the civil rights activists we're actually doing something positive rather than misbehaving. And it is very difficult for me to explain to you years later how important that was. Before the march on Washington, a fellow by the name of A. Philip Randolph, who was the dean of the civil rights movement, spoke to the, P uh, to the press corps saying that tomorrow in the march on Washington, the day that made Martin Luther King very, very famous, and some people believe that Martin Luther King is the only person that spoke on that day, and it's obviously not true. The day before, 
A. Philip Randolph, the dean of the civil rights movement, the elder statesman of the civil rights movement, spoke to the press corps. Imagine the press corps in the United States in 1963. Predominantly white, urban, suburban, male. They could see something like a march on Washington as being threatening, violent, unacceptable, and A. Philip Randolph said, imagine that you would be reporting on the events leading up to the war for independence in the United States. Imagine that you're reporting on people that are simply making a civil gesture to work toward getting what the nation promises them to be their civil rights. It's very important if you're going to have an event that you try to then influence how the reporters are going to cover that event. So important uh, that the leadership in the civil rights movement and the March on Washington did not forget that. Can we get that uh, slide back up? There we go, thank you. Um, how is this frame influenced by a sense of audience held by the reporter? We often find reporters telling people about the news on the assumption that this is what people want to hear. Rush does that, I'm sure, and that's fine. People tune in to find out what Rush is thinking. Uh, how is this shaped by other influences such as political correctness or power elites? Uh, on our next lecture, we talk a lot about semiotics. We talk a lot about critical cultural theory, uh, where there are people that argue that we create images and deep structures within the understanding of our society. We convey these as to what is right and wrong, acceptable and unacceptable, uh, and that becomes a real substantial debate. Uh, frames also can become societal archetypes, meaning that we report in certain ways over time on certain things. Are businessmen only crooks, con men, and clowns? Are Westerners only likely to want to destroy the environment with grazing and mining and road building and logging and all of these kinds of things? So we get all of these frames. And the political correctness movement was obviously designed to alter some of the interpretive frames uh, in society. We still have that going on. Uh, we've had a summer of debate over openly gay members of the clergy. And people suggested that may tear a church apart. Well, to some extent, it's a frame, isn't it? It is an interpretive frame by which people see behavior. And how they interpret that behavior and what they think of that behavior is then a matter of screens. It is a matter of attitudes. It's a matter of beliefs. It's a matter of behavioral intentions. Well, the last theory that we want to talk about this morning maybe in some respects the most powerful of all the theories that we discuss, lays a foundation for what we're going to talk about on Thursday. Uses and gratifications theory argues that, among other things, human beings are sovereign viewers. We use the media rather than the media use us. That's why this morning when some of you were arguing that the media manipulate us, uh, there is a very strong body of literature which suggests that we use the media very selectively. Uh, that we don't watch everything, we don't watch everything in the same way that other people would, etc., etc. People are sovereign viewers, readers or listeners, and in such they select from a menu and they consume strategically. This body of literature suggests, for instance, that we have a variety of needs that we want filled and we know that the media in all of its infinite variety of forms can help us to solve those needs. Now, let's imagine metaphor. Life is a cafeteria. Now, I know that some of you, like me, when I go to the cafeteria, I have a hard time deciding what I want to eat. I want to eat everything. It all looks pretty good, right? But there I am. I'm given an opportunity to eat all kinds of stuff. The question is, from all of this stuff, what do I pick? What do I watch? What we're going to find next chapter is I can also shift time. I don't have to be there. I can capture it. I can put it on a DVD. I can put it on a VHS, and I can watch it at another time. So we see how we like to do that, don't we? And if I miss it when it came out in the movies, I can always go down to my blockbuster. 
Why are we so aggressive when we go in and we see all of the CDs that are available for us to pick what we think we like? We go in to see all of the magazines. We don't buy them all. We buy certain of these. We don't watch everything on television. We watch certain stuff. And why do we do that? Well, one of the arguments is, in a sense, that we are seeking subjective expected utilities. We're looking for rewards. We're seeking to avoid negative outcomes. You may remember from our persuasion theory, a theory called information integration. You may remember that I said there is a mathematical formula. Don't let it freak you out, you communication majors. I told you that mathematical formula would come back. It's like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I will be back. 363, page 363, there it is again. It argues that like all of the other choices in our life, the buying of a variety of cars, we're not going to buy all cars, we're going to buy the car that we think is the most rewarding. That was an illustration that we used in the chapter on persuasion. Same thing is true here. I get my program guide, I find out what's available on television, and I select. I'm a real fan of Tony Hillerman books. Tony Hillerman is a guy that writes mysteries based upon the life experience of Navajos and other Native Americans, uh, people from New Mexico, etc., 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 and Arizona. And on Sunday evening past, there was the second dramatization of a Tony Hillerman novel. I set that aside. I wanted to see it. Wes Studi, some of you may know the name of Wes Studi, I think he's a very, very good Native American actor. I think that he's from Oklahoma, might be Cherokee, started life as a bull rider, worked his way up to an actor, played a very, very fine role in the movie Last of the Mohicans. That might be a way that you would remember Wes Studi. Uh, plays a character, I think he's very, very good. I wanted to see how this worked out. It wasn't just random behavior, was it? I strategically had to work it into my life. I also set up my DVD burner so that if all things work right, and I can't predict that they were, that I've captured it so I can see it again. I can let other people see it. Why do we do that? The argument is that we use the media as a part of our world experiences. We're going to talk about, in the next lecture, play theory. Play theory suggests that we like to play, and one of the ways in which we can play is with the media. The media bring entertainment to us. We know how to demand of the media that they entertain us. We select that which is entertaining. We even have people called television reviewers and movie reviewers that may help us to make more strategic selections. There are music reviewers. Why does all of that exist? Because we're sovereign viewers, consumers. Well, okay. Page 362 in the book, there are a list of needs. One of these, and this sort of sounds like what we started with, why do we have the media around in the first place? First of all, they satisfy some of our cognitive needs. They tell us something that we want to know. If there's a storm going on, we may spend a lot of time looking to see if the storm is about over, if it's going to repeat itself, where is it happening. We may listen to the radio. The radio may, maybe will give us storm warnings. Some of us even have NOAA radios that we can tune into NOAA. We can just have weather reports all that we want to. Affective needs. Do you look for various kinds of entertainment to have a predictable kind of emotion on you? People look forward to the Super Bowl. If the Super Bowl at the halftime is 88 to 3, do we stay to see if it's going to be 88 to 89 at the end? We say, I'm giving up. This is no longer exciting. We want it to be exciting. We want it to be close. If you tune into a mystery and you know from the very outset, unless it's certain mysteries where they tell you sort of from the outset who did it, and then it's a question of them unraveling how it works. To some extent, Perry Mason was that way, right? You don't know who Perry Mason is? Well, that's all right. But Perry Mason, you always knew that the one person that was innocent, other than Perry Mason, was the person that Perry Mason was representing. That was the one innocent person that you could know. The judge was even likely to be the suspect. Well, not really. Okay, Columbo? Columbo's going to find out who it is that committed the crime, and you may even know from the outset who did it, but the question is, can Columbo 
stumble on in a clever way to all of the clues. Well, the notion is we have affective needs. We want to be entertained. Personal integrative needs. To what extent do I want the media to help me to define who I am? Social integrative needs. To what extent do I use the media to tell me how to get along with other people? We know that young people, adolescents, love programs that have to do with interpersonal communication, relationship development. They're fascinated by that. Why do people like friends? Because it helps you to deal with relationships. Relationships are important to you, social integrative. And finally, escapist needs. Oops, we need our slide up again. I'm sorry. Now, I don't know how many of you, as we get close to the end of the semester, have written down your list of movies to see over the holiday, or you've got a stack of novels that you have put aside as the semester has gone along and said, boy, you give me three days after the finals. I've now rested myself up. I'm going to read 42 novels over the holiday. Uh, some of you say, well, I'm going to finally catch up on all the videos that I downloaded that I haven't had a chance to see. Escapist. It will allow us. Some of you don't like movies. I do. I love to go into a movie. There's something wonderful about it. There we were last summer in the movie house with the sound all around us. The light gets dark. You've got your popcorn in one hand, your big soft drink in the other hand. And you watch on this screen for some amount of time something. And you know what? You don't have to worry about school. You don't have to worry about taxes. You don't have to worry about car repairs. You have escaped. The media will allow us to escape, won't it? It will allow us to get away from our daily routines. Well, the question then is, how does all of this work? On page 364, there is a model that says that we have beliefs and evaluations about what it is that is entertaining. We've heard that certain uh, uh, entertainers that we like have just put out a new release. So we show up at our local CDs. We have gratifications that we are seeking. That's the second part of the model, uh, 9.4 on page 364. Gratifications sought. We then consume the media, we buy the CD, we take it home and we play it. And the question is, did we satisfy ourselves? Did we get the gratifications that we had sought? I like very much a jazz violinist by the name of Regina Car uh, Carter. I don't know that any of you have ever heard of her, but there last summer was her new release and she plays an adaptation of a, classic, a classical composer on jazz violin. I could hardly wait to get home and put it in to see what was going on. Does she do well? She showed up in town one time, went down, paid good money to listen to her. See, we do that, don't we? The notion is that we seek and choose among all of the media out there what it is that we find. Now, when I taste food, if I like it, do I keep tasting it again? Probably so. If I taste food and don't like it, I then try to avoid it. Isn't that the same thing that I tune into a television program at the beginning of the new season and if it's entertaining I say I want to stay with it and if I don't like it I say it's not interesting I want to watch something else. In one sense then this is the way in which we dominate as sovereign viewers what it is that the industry will provide. If we are not an audience they are then not going to put out a product. Now, as bad as it may sound, and I know that talking about certain topics can be really difficult at various times, as often as we have in the last number of years in the United States tried to do away with pornography, pornography persists. Uh, we even mentioned, uh, I think maybe last time, that one of the predictors as to why the Internet was so successful at the beginning was it gave people access to pornography. Uses and gratifications. Some of you may say it's the most disgusting stuff in the world. I wish it weren't there. You're quite privileged to have that opinion. But the fact is, it is there because people want it. What's even worse, of course, is that we know that child pornography is out there, which is legally and ethically considered to be child abuse. 
It is irresponsible, but it is there, unfortunately, because there is a market for it. Well, I think that proves something. Does the existence of pornography make people interested in pornography? Or were people interested in pornography and then turned to pornography? We can often see some of the elements of media utilization and gratification quite differently when we look at what is often either one not talked about or some of the extremes. Well, the theme that we get into is that people have a variety of needs. They want all of the things that we talked about to use the media in various ways. And the media know that, and they try to create formats that appeal. Now, one of the best bits of evidence as to how this works was we one time had three networks. Well, we actually had fewer than that. But we got up to three networks, ABC, NBC, CBS. Then we got more networks. We got educational television. Then we got cable. To what extent can you watch television without watching network programming? Secondly, if you want to watch programming that has something to do with strange guys from Australia that like to handle crocodiles and spiders and snakes, are you going to see that on network? Or are you going to have to go find the crocodile guy? You've got animal channels. We've got guy channels. We've got chick channels. Uh, we've got classic channels. We've got children's channels. The assumption being that all of these are markets out there. People wanting to use the media to gratify themselves. When the videos at the store are old, do they just want to throw those away? Or is there a time when you want to go back and get the video again? Or you missed it? Or you're rummaging through it down there on a Friday night? And you want to see either the new releases or you want to see the classics. Or maybe you want to see a comedy. Or you want to see something else. A couple of times when I've had dental surgery, they give me medication, but I don't like medication if I can handle it. What do I do then? Before my dental surgery, I go in, I get a stack of James Bond, I get a stack of Pink Panther, Inspector Clouseau. I have no pain. They call me, are you taking your medication? No, why not? I'm watching Clouseau, don't bother me. It's medication. It's distraction. It's, you know, all of this kind of stuff. I go down every once in a while to Target in my nights in town here. I buy myself DVDs. I stockpile them. I carry them to the country. One night I'm in there and I found four Inspector Clouseau DVDs. I'm a happy guy. I'm stockpiling. I'm creating at my little place out in Carmine just what I want so that at any point in time I can get into my stockpile, and I've, I can't find it on cable, maybe I can find it in my stockpile. Or maybe I'll read a magazine, or maybe I'll look at a catalog, or maybe, you see what I'm saying is that this is the argument that I make, is that uses and gratification theory, the assumption that we have in mind various rewards that we want, various uh, kinds of disincentives that we know about, and we navigate the media like we go into a cafeteria, picking and choosing, looking to see that which is more rewardable, that which is going to do for us what we want to do. We're going to see this laying a foundation next time for dependency theory. We're also going to see this theory very much laying a foundation to explain why new communication technology is so interesting to us. Because new communication technology will allow us now even more access to that which we want to use and to gratify us. So we'll explore that uh, as time goes on. Thank mm -hmm. you.